video file, we're going to talk about nasogastric suction tubes. And so we're talking about the Salem sump, so not to be confused with the nasogastric feeding tube. The Salem sump is used to decompress the abdomen and to remove any stomach contents. So the role of the nurse, besides insertion and removal, will also include recording input and output, providing oral care, avoiding any skin breakdown, and make sure they keep their head of the bed up 30 to 40 degrees at all times. When we're thinking about insertion, there's a couple things we have to do. We'd make sure we have an order, the right patient. We're gonna have all of our supplies at hand. And when we take our Salem sump tube here, we need to measure from the nose to the earlobe to the xiphoid process. And so on this patient, I can see it's at the number 65. So I can put a small piece of tape there if I want to or I can remember that I'm stopping at 65. I would have explained the procedure to the patient. I'd have protective gear on. I'd have um, a chucks pad on the patient's chest in case they throw up. I also want to make sure they have an anesthesis basin. I would also um, get them a glass of water if they're allowed to have, if they're allowed to uh, drink water and they don't have any swallowing issues. I can give them a glass of water with a straw so they can swallow. That'll help move the tube down the throat. So once I've lubricated this tube, I'm going to kind of put my hand behind the patient's neck here and have them extend. As I begin to insert, I'm going to ask them to swallow once I hit the back of the throat here. And at that point, I would have them bring their head forward. And I'm going to continue to ask them to swallow, swallow, as I gently insert. I want to make sure I look at their mouth to make sure it's not coiling and coming out of their mouth. And I continue to insert until I get to my tape. Once I get to my tape, some sites will have the nose pieces of tape that you can use. Um, otherwise, you can take a piece of your paper tape and put it on the nose and secure it by wrapping the tape around the tube. And you can put additional tape on to make sure that it is um, secure on your patients. A lot of times it'll get taped to the gown to make sure that it doesn't get pulled. And we want to make sure that this air vent um, stays above the abdomen because this is our vent that will help let any air that's building up in the stomach get out. They would then be connected to their suction setup. And your, what you have at your site will, may look different but you would get them connected to their suction setup, which would typically be on the wall, or maybe you have a mobile suction setup, and they will turn it on to usually low intermittent suction, and you will begin to remove the stomach contents. So here this talks about what we kind of just talked about um, already, but just kind of a refresher there for you is some of that information that I just said to you. The canisters will look different. You may have something that looks like what's on the image or what I have here in front of you. But basically, you know, your role to record the INO is going to be looking um, each shift how much that patient gets out and recording it in your, however your hospital does their charting. Um, gastric lavage is where you're going to be instilling some fluid for um, some time and removing it. So it may be that you were doing um, a lavage with let's say charcoal. Um, so you would be instilling the charcoal and then it may be suctioned out or it may be left in there for a while. So it just kind of depends. But for any type of lavage, you'd be putting whatever is ordered into the gut, letting it rest, and then either manually aspirating it or hooking them up to intermittent suction. But anytime we're doing any lavage, you wanna again, make sure we're watching vital signs or worried about electrolyte imbalances. If we have to remove this NG tube now, um, there's a couple things that we need to do. First of all, we would stop our suction and disconnect everything. And you can see next on the list, it tells you you need to instill 50 mLs of air. And you'd have your large uh, Tumi syringe and you would insert the air here. And we're doing that to clear any contents that might be in this. So it might be that there was a flush done recently and there's water in here or it might be stomach contents that were being sucked out. So either way, we wanna push all that back into the stomach. 
So we'd make sure we have all the tape removed. So we're ready to pull this tube out. And so when we're ready, we want to, again, have our emesis basin here. Um, I might have a towel under here to help kind of catch any, there might be some stomach contents that come out on the tube when I'm removing it. But what I want to do is I want to pinch the tube, and I want to ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold it. So as they do that, they take a deep breath and hold it. I pinch this tube. I begin to pull this out very gently but swiftly. Again, making sure I you know, kind of cover their face so no stomach contents get in their mouth. While they're doing it, that them holding them bre their breath, me pinching the tube and flushing that tube with air decreases their risk of aspirating any of that stomach content. So you're gonna remove that, make sure you do good oral care afterwards, um, and then you make sure you document the procedure. So now, uh, when we think about introducing food to this patient, it may be that the provider wants to keep the NG tube in, but not on suction, just for a little while while we initiate food. And that can be just to make sure that they're tolerating it. So uh, it may be that they keep the NG tube in for a shift or two, and once they're tolerating, we'll remove the tube. That is not uncommon. But typically when we're introducing foods, we're starting with clear liquids first and we want to make sure that they tolerate that before we advance um, to the next level of food. We do have to be careful with broths and Gatorade for our elderly patients because they are high in sodium. So if we have patients who have sodium restrictions, they're at heart failure, renal failure, and we want to kind of watch how much sodium we give them, we'll have to be careful of that. But we want to make sure we're assessing their tolerance to the diet, assessing for bowel sounds, and then we'll kind of advance to the soft bland diet and then back to their regular diet once they're tolerating that. That concludes this video. Thank you.